This is A Different Perspective with Kevin Randall. A retired U.S. Lieutenant Colonel, Kevin Randall has been studying UFOs for nearly 50 years. Kevin has investigated some of the most famous UFO cases in the world and has been consulted for dozens of documentaries about UFOs. Considered one of the leading experts into the Roswell UFO crash of 1947, Kevin has written more than 25 books about UFOs, including the recently published Roswell in the 21st century. Now, here is the host of A Different Perspective, Kevin Randall. And uh, good day to you all. I am flying solo today. I am the host, of course, Kevin Randall. And uh, things have been going on in the world of UFOs that I thought we would touch on. And I think there's some things that we need to discuss that uh, if you have a guest on, it's hard to uh, get everything in that I wanted to talk about today. So I thought it would be a good time to uh, do some of that. I got in the last week a couple of emails um, that that mentioned a quote that I had made, a, a statement I had made literally decades ago, uh, maybe as much as 25 years ago. And it was toward the point in the Roswell investigation where we were learning that many of the witnesses, and some of them the ones that we really thought were important, like Frank Kaufman, had not been completely candid to us. And I said to uh, a host of a radio show that uh, uh, the status of the Roswell case made me want to throw up. And I thought, uh, in today's environment, that's a bit uh, indelicate. I could probably have phrased it better. But at the time, what had happened, as I, as I mentioned, we, would, we were learning that Glenn Dennis, his nurse, didn't exist. We were learning that Frank Kaufman had been a civilian employee at the uh, Roswell Army Airfield, but he had not been a master sergeant, as he claimed, and he had not been trained in intelligence. We had the alien autopsy to deal with, which uh, caused a great deal of anguish for us as well. So I had made this comment based on the status of the case at that point, losing some of the witnesses that provided us, I guess, with the most exciting testimony. Jim Ragsdale, for example, was telling us that uh, he had been out on a uh, tryst in the New Mexico desert when the uh, UFO flown over, flew over and crashed uh, not that far from where he and his lady friend were having some fun. And I always thought, and I started some lectures with this, that this is the way a lot of the science fiction movies start. I think specifically of The Blob with Steve McQueen, or as he was then known, Stephen McQueen, where uh, they're out uh, seeing the thing land and go out there, and The Blob, of course, uh, gets away from them. So it was a fun way to start a lecture, and I thought it you know, brought a more human element to it than just the, the, the static facts. And we, of course, we learned Jim Ragsdale was not as candid as he, as he could be. So I had made that indelicate statement and uh, proving that nothing, and this was in the pre-internet uh, days before everything was uh, out there for people to respond to or to find in the past. Um, but it's a, a statement that at the time seemed to be appropriate. I could have been more eloquent in how I had mentioned it and gone on from there. Uh, later on, other things have come forward that helped us uh, maybe revitalize the case or, 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 or made it not look as bleak as it had at that point. I, I'm thinking of people like um, Joe Briley, who is the operations officer in Roswell in 1947, talking to us about some of the things and, and some of the other witnesses who had come forward or who we found later on that provided additional information, which I thought was, uh, was very important. The other thing that kind of annoys me is that we still have to deal with admitted hoaxes. People have created their their sightings or they've made the sightings up or whatever, but put plug themselves into an important event like Roswell and and not telling us the truth and learning that they're not telling us the truth and they admit to it. And I think specifically of the alien autopsy, which I mentioned just a moment ago, how uh, we all were chasing that thing because here allegedly was the smoking gun for alien visitation. And I know I was somewhat skeptical in the beginning, but I was willing to take a look at the evidence. I, I knew people who had been in the, the premiere of the alien autopsy film. We were told originally that there were two, uh, two hours and 30 minutes of film. Uh, it had pictures of the um, uh, craft on the ground and the 
attempts to remove it. And Harry Truman had been walking around the, the site. And when all was said and done, we found out there was uh, not that many minutes to the alien autopsy. And one of the things they said, well, it, it came about because uh, Ray Santilli was attempting to buy footage of early rock and roll stars in the United States, Elvis being one of them. And somehow he ended up with this cameraman who apparently had done some of that kind of photographic work as a civilian, who claimed allegedly that he had been called in to uh, film things going on in the, I guess the autopsies, both in the tent autopsy and the one in the hospital. And uh, Santilli said, well, I can't tell you his name because he's afraid of repercussions. And I'm thinking this makes no sense because if the guy was telling the truth, then the government already knows his name. And now he's out there shooting his mouth off about having this basically stolen top secret footage. Uh, the government could easily find him. And he's talking about how um, he paid $100,000 for the footage or whatever it was. And I'm thinking, well, the IRS will probably be interested in that as well, because I'm pretty sure he didn't declare it on his income taxes. Uh, later on, of course, the guys who created the film came forward and talked about it. They provided pictures of the creation of the aliens, uh, eliminating all of this. And at one point, uh, he said, they admitted, well, the tent footage was faked, not faked. The tent footage was not faked. Yeah, I'm sorry. Tent footage was faked because the original tent, tent footage was so dark, it was not, they couldn't broadcast it. So they recreated it. And that was what uh, we had seen. And even that footage was too dark. And that was an admitted hoax. And then later on, we found out that other parts of the autopsy took place in a hospital was fake. But there were some real frames cut into that to make it more authentic. And I think what an incredibly stupid thing to do. You've got, even if the, if the footage isn't that good, you've got frames that you could take from it. You've got the footage that you can show. And this would be important to have it. But what you've done now is you've recreated the hospital autopsy, but you've put some real frames in it. Well, you've just, just discredited the whole thing. But it's an admitted hoax, and yet there are people who are still insisting that there is something to the alien autopsy. Uh, I am thoroughly convinced it was a hoax, it's an admitted hoax, and we should go on from there. Uh, this kind of moves me into the Project Mogul thing, which that explanation is a hoax. Yeah, the Project Mogul did exist. It was uh, what was going on in New Mexico was not highly classified. The purpose was classified, but what they were doing in New Mexico was not classified. Pictures of the balloon launches came out in the newspapers two days after they announced in Roswell they had a flying saucer. But uh, what was important, and I credit um, Colonel Weaver for this, he got uh, all the field notes, the diaries and things relating to the experimentation going on in New Mexico to create this constant level balloon. Uh, which is a balloon that would stay at, at, at certain altitudes for long periods of time. And it was the purpose was to uh, try to record atomic detonations in the Soviet Union to see if they've, they've been able to uh, create an atomic bomb. But what uh, Colonel Weaver had done was provide us with all that documentation. And if you go through it, you find out that the culprit that they announced, it was uh, flight number four of Project Mole, it was canceled. According to the documentation, it was canceled. And what I do not understand to this day is why there are skeptics who still insist that Project Mogul is the explanation, knowing the documentation disproves it. And if they had documentation, dis or when they have documentation disproving other aspects of the UFO phenomenon, they, they tout it. Where we have it removing Project Mogul, um, they have all kinds of excuses. Well, we don't know exactly when it was canceled. Yes, we do. It was at dawn. Charles Moore, who was one of the project engineers in Alamogordo, New Mexico, where the launches were taking place, uh, had said that uh, they uh, launched the balloon array at uh, 2.30 in the morning or 3.30 in the morning. The problem was that under the regulations they were working, they could not launch these arrays in the dark or in climate weather or cloudy weather because they be become a hazard to aerial navigation. So we know that. And so to get the balloons toward the Brazel Ranch, more had to have a launch prior to uh, dawn. The, the flight was canceled at dawn. Well, how do you launch the balloons two or three hours earlier and then cancel the flight? They also said it was uh, uh, as, as successful as flight number five, which we have the records for. And the question then becomes, well, then why aren't uh, flight number four's um, 
results also captured in the documentation? And the answer is because it didn't fly. Moore told me personally that if the flight was canceled, they couldn't put the helium back into the bottles. So they sometimes uh, did experiments which would have stayed on the Ella, the Alamogordo, the right White Sands missile range ranges or uh, was not a long array of stuff. So it was not a hazard to aerial navigation. So I think that the um, Mogul people need to take a look at the documentation and explain why we should accept it when we have the documentation that proves it was canceled. I was going to mention uh, the Condon Committee is another great hoax because their conclusions were given to them by the Air Force when they commissioned the study prior to any investigation. I've talked about that before, and uh, you can take a look at my blog at uh, kevinrandall.blogspot.com. Just type in Condon Committee, and you can read some of that information. But I did want to go to Kingman because I just got this morning. It's unbelievable. This morning, um, somebody said a clipping, uh, a, a clip from uh, the Leonard Seymour, in search of Leonard Nimoy's show from the uh, late 70s, I think it was, maybe early 80s, and he had a segment on Kingman talking about that. Now, the problem with the Kingman story, and I've, I've uh, published that in the past, and I've published other information about it, um, is single witness, and there's no real evidence for it. Some of the things that uh, the witness, Arthur Stansel, who was interviewed by Ray Fowler, who was a respected researcher, by the way, but um, is contradicted by other things that he said. And I think that uh, the Kingman case is a hoax. It's not an admitted hoax, but the evidence is very, very weak for it being authentic. We had at one point a uh, witness, Judy Wolcott, who claimed that her husband had been part of this, this recovery team back in 1953 in Kingman. And he eventually had been sent to Vietnam being as a, a, a Air Force person who was killed in Vietnam, but he sent her a letter with all the details in it. Uh, and she, of course, couldn't produce the letter. Uh, about the time that my book, Crash When UFOs Fall from the Sky, came out, talking about Wolcott and Arthur Stanzel and that sort of information, I got a call from her daughter who said that her mother, Judy Wolcott, tended to make things up, and her father hadn't been killed in Vietnam and was still alive. So that kind of turns me off to the... Uh, the Kingman crash because the evidence doesn't support it. People who were in the area don't remember it. And I've got some things on my web, uh, uh, my blog about that. Uh, I, one from an attorney who said that he got interested in the case a number of years ago and interviewed a number of people, old timers in the area. They, they knew nothing about this thing. So I think the Kingman crash is pretty well uh, a, a hoax as well because of the lack of credible uh, witnesses and the lack of any kind of documentation to talk about it. Other cases, even Roswell, there's documentation for it. Some of it's not very good documentation, but there is documentation with, with this one, there's not. I'm going to uh, take a quick break here because it's time. And when I come back, I'm going to talk about Level Land and what I've learned about that. And it might be uh, find some interesting information there. So I will be back right after this. <music> Are you ready for a tale that will leave you on the edge of your seat? Get ready to dive into the gripping memoir by Bart Sabrell titled Moon Man. Bart Sabrell takes you on a heart-pounding journey, unmasking the truth behind America's famous Apollo missions. Prepare yourself for hair-raising encounters with agents from the U.S. government's top secret agencies. In Moon Man, Sabrell fearlessly reveals his real-life espionage adventures, shining a light on one of the CIA's best-kept secrets. Brace yourself for shocking revelations, including Sabrell's discovery of privately recorded audio exposing an Apollo astronaut's chilling plot, a plot orchestrated by the CIA. That's right, as Sabrell unveils this groundbreaking evidence, it becomes clear that there is much more to the Apollo missions than meets the eye. Could it be that we've been deceived all along? Moon Man is a gripping page-turner that challenges everything you thought you knew. It's a mind-bending journey into the unknown, where the line between truth and fiction becomes blurred. Don't miss this opportunity to uncover the secrets hidden for decades. Let your curiosity guide you as you join Bart Sabrell on his quest to find the truth. Moon Man, available now at Sibrel.com. That's S-I-B-R-E-L.com. Prepare to have your beliefs shaken to the very core.
And I am back, as you can plainly see. Uh, when we went away, I said I was going to talk about Level Land. I think there are a number of UFO cases that have they been properly investigated at the time. If we had full information about them at the time uh, of the sightings or the, case, uh, the crashes, we would be having a whole different set of conversations about that. And Level Land is one of those. It's not a, a weak case. It's a case with multiple chains of evidence. And I think it uh, could lead us to the off-world explanation. I kind of like that uh, that term for the extraterrestrial as opposed to the extraterrestrial. It's kind of an interesting science fiction -y term. Uh, Level Land took place on the evening, late night of November 2nd and into the morning of November 3rd, 1957, around Level Land, Texas, which, of course, is just uh, west of Lubbock, Texas, for those of you who'd like to look it up on your map. According to the sheriff, and I, I say this every time I bring him up, his name was Ware, Ware Clem. I mean, why couldn't he have a good name like Steve McQueen or something? I don't know. But um, he said in an interview that there were hundreds of sightings of this object over a period of two, two and a half hours. Um, I think that might be a bit of an over-exaggeration, but there were certainly dozens of those. And it started with uh, two fellas in a pickup truck that uh, saw a bright, I guess, blue glowing object that approached their truck and landed. And when it did, their engine, the engine of their truck stalled, the radio faded away, and the headlights went out. And they sat there kind of paralyzed. The one guy, Pedro Sacido, he jumped out of the car and rolled un uh, under the truck and rolled underneath him. Uh, his passenger just sat there petrified after about four or five minutes, the object turned a bright red, red and took off. And once it was gone, the, the truck started. So Saucedo wanted to report to the authorities, but he didn't want to go into level land because that was the direction that the UFO had gone. So he went and found another phone and called the sheriff's office. And of course, their reaction was that he was he was drunk or he was playing a joke or he was uh, mentally uh, unbalanced talking about this weird story but then the sheriff's office and, and the police department started getting an awful lot of phone calls about the same sort of phenomena a close approach of a glowing red ufo uh, maybe hovering close to them or landing close to them and the car's engine stalling and the um, other electrical uh, components of the of the vehicle failed uh, after so many of these calls, the sheriff himself decided he'd go out to see what he could see about this. And what's important about this with him uh, in his car was a deputy sheriff. Behind his car was a car with uh, members of the De De Texas Department of Public Safety. I think it's still called that, which is basically the state police. More importantly, behind that car, and this is something that I found out in my investigation, which I, I put in the book Level Land, was a, was a third car, and that was filled with Air Force officers. Reese Air Force Base, which is in Lubbock, Texas, and is about uh, 15, 20 minutes from, from Level Land, uh, followed the sheriff. And according to the Air Force file on the case, the sheriff said that he'd just seen a streak of light that lasted about two seconds in the distance, didn't get very close to it. Prior to the Air Force investigation, he had told reporters that it was a oval-shaped or football-shaped object, a bright glowing red uh, that he had seen. Later on, after the Air Force investigation, where he made the claim of the streak of light, he told Don Berlin, not I'm sorry, Don Berliner, that he had seen the, uh, the object much, much closer. The next day, and this comes from Don Berlinson, uh, Don Berlinson interviewed the, the police department, the sheriff's department mechanic, the next day and the only reason i can think of is that the sheriff would take in the car and to be checked is it stalled and he wanted to see if, if there was a mechanical reason for that but the problem with that is if he was close enough for his car to stall then the car behind him stalled and the car with the air force officer stalled so they had a very good cadre of witnesses who had seen the object much closer than it showed in the Air Force files, and it stalled their cars. There were lots of other witnesses who made the same same claim about their, their car stalling, uh, a close approach, and that sort of thing. And it, and it lasted for about two and a half hours. Uh, later on that same night, over at uh, White Sands Missile Range, uh, 
patrol of MPs, two guys in, in a Jeep, and I, I talked to one of them, as a matter of fact, said that um, they had seen this glowing object that came down and basically landed on the range. Their Jeep didn't stall. They didn't get close enough. They'd seen it from a far enough distance, but uh, they had seen it land. And I asked specifically, now it was down mostly below the horizon. There were mountains in the area. So when it landed, it would have been in front of those mountains. And they said, he said, yes, that that's true. The Air Force wrote it off as a, I think a sighting of the moon. I'm not sure when the moon would be landing at White Sands, but that is kind of where they're their explanation went. The Air Force sent a uh, mid-level NCO, the staff sergeant, which is an E-5 in the Air Force, uh, out to investigate it. He spent almost an entire seven hours in level land investigating and he talked to the sheriff for a while. He disappeared. He came back and then he eventually left. Uh, he found I think he had uh, statements from six witnesses, including the sheriff. And that's where we get the idea it was a streak of light. Uh, and that was all he found, and he had a solution. It might have been ball lightning. Well, anybody who knows anything about ball lightning knows that it's very short-lived, if it exists at all, and there's still debate whether it really exists. Um, it's maybe 18 inches to two feet in diameter. It doesn't stall cars. It fades away, and it's an extremely rare phenomenon. So the explanation doesn't work, but that's the official explanation. The other thing that kind of annoys me, and this is – how the um, government and the Air Force tend to hide these things is the Air Force claimed there were only three witnesses who saw an object in, in level land. Don Kehoe, yeah, there's a lot of Dons in this story. Don Kehoe of NICAP said there were nine witnesses who'd seen the object. Going through the Air Force files and looking up the names, I found 13 people who'd seen the object. But the point is the argument devolved from what did they see? What could it have been? What can we do to investigate this thing to uh, the idea of uh, the number of witnesses and what they said? There were literally dozens, and you go through the newspaper files of the time, you can find additional names and that sort of thing. Uh, the uh, Condon Committee, when they did their investigation, I would think this would be a case they would want to have looked at. And they did look at some of the historical cases. But Level Land is only mentioned once or twice in the uh, Condon report, and both times it was just like a paragraph said, well, we couldn't do anything with the Leveland case because we couldn't get our hands on the cars. And it was like too long ago, 1957 as opposed to 1967. Their theory was that if you could mag uh, uh, magnetically map the car, uh, a strong magnetic field near a car would change its magnetic properties. And what they were thinking was if you could get cars made from the same plant at the same time and uh, map uh, the magnetic properties of those cars, and then the, the one that was subjected to the strong field, you might find a, an interesting deviation, which would suggest the one car had been exposed to a very strong magnetic field, but they felt they couldn't do that. I think it's a great idea. And I used to go out and when I'd get a new car is magnetically map it myself. And what, what I was doing was simply using a compass and setting it at different parts of the, the metallic parts, the hood, the, the, the roof and the trunk, to see which uh, way the um, the needle on the, mag uh, the compass pointed and make a record of that so that if I was ever exposed to a magnetic field, I could check it out and see what happened. Of course, that never happened, but it was a, a way of doing that. Anyway, I got involved in this because I was interested in the uh, multiple chains of evidence. You had the um, witness testimony you had the interaction with the environment, meaning the uh, magnetic effects, which no one really bothered to chase down. And there was a third component. According to, again, moving back to Don Berlinson, he had talked to a rancher who had taken the sheriff out to a point on his ranch, I think it was north of Level Land, where there was a large circular burned area. And so then you had a landing trace. So you've got different components of uh, the case. And had it been investigated properly at the time, paying particular attention to the eyewitness testimony and the electromagnetic effects and that sort of thing, you could have made a very strong case. Remember the French Academy of Science said that it said in 1802 that uh, rocks don't fall from the sky, but there was a meteor that fell in a portion of France, rocks basically falling from the sky. And because that area had been surveyed a couple of years earlier, geologically surveyed, 
they found that these rocks now didn't match any of the geology of the area. They had lots of eyewitness testimony. So they had the multiple chains of evidence you need to make a strong case. And in Level Land, we, had the, we, we could have done that sort of thing. So I looked at the whole case um, much, much later. A lot of the witnesses were, were gone and I had to rely on secondhand testimony, which I'm usually loath to do. But there again, in the newspapers, I could get the contemporary accounts of what was going on. And I've, I found lots of witnesses in the area about the time who had similar problems. There was a couple up near Amarillo. And if you look at a map, Amarillo is about two hours north of, of um, Level Land, whose car was stalled on the highway. And uh, when the UFO left, they couldn't get it started again. And they had to have it towed into Amarillo and found out the battery was burned out. So they went and reported to the police and the police being the competent officials they are, didn't bother to write down their names. They just sent one of the deputies out to that section of the highway to make sure everything was open and it wouldn't uh, cause any other problems. It would have been great to have their names other than a description of what they looked like, but they didn't take uh, take enough um, trouble to write down the names. There, this was a time where there was a lot of these sorts of sightings now around the country. And uh, I think the, the skeptics point to, well, the one sighting triggered all these others. I'm not sure that's a, a fair evaluation, especially because a lot of the sightings around Level Land specifically um, were called in during the night and there was no social media where people say, guess what just happened to me here in this area and you can go take a look at it. Um, so you've got, you've got an awful lot of eyewitness testimony and it happened in other parts of the country where there were other multiple witness sightings and landing traces and there were um, electromagnetic effects. So Level Land to me is a very important case simply because of those specific aspects of it. I, I wish that uh, the Air Force hadn't been in the business of explaining sightings at the time, but it had really been in the business of investigating the sightings. The fact that they sent in a low ranking NCO, a middle ranking NCO I probably should say, uh, is not a big worry, but I would have liked to have seen them send somebody with a little bit more rank behind them. A lot of the sightings were investigated by mid-level NCOs and junior officers, uh, second lieutenants and first lieutenants. And uh, a, a few were investigated by higher ranking officers. I think that adds a certain uh, cachet to the, to the sighting report by having someone with a little bit of seniority investigating it, but that didn't happen. In the um, White Sands, uh, part of it. They had an Air Force investigator come in. He talked to the three of the four witnesses. There was a second sighting later on that where similar things had happened. He could talk to all, he could talk to three of them, but one was supposedly on, on the three-day pass and they couldn't get him back. I know from my military experience, when you have a three-day pass, you have to leave a, a contact information and you have to be within a certain distance of the base. You have to remain in, inside that circle because you might be it might be necessary to recall you. The story is that the fourth guy was in the hospital due to some kind of burns that he had suffered in the sighting. Uh, Carl Lorenzen reports on that, and I've seen that in a couple of other places. So it makes it a much better sighting because you have that additional effect going on that might have uh, provided us with some information. Anyway, that's kind of the level land case. I'll be talking about some other UFO cases, probably Socorro in just a minute, so stick around. Are you ready to dive into the mysteries of the unknown? Tune into the electrifying X-Zone radio TV show hosted by the one and only Rob McConnell. I'm Rob McConnell and get ready for a mind-bending journey through the unexplained phenomenon that surrounds us all. From UFO encounters to cryptids, ghosts and everything in between, we've got it covered here in the X-Zone. Rob McConnell, the seasoned investigator and renowned radio personality, brings you the most compelling interviews with top experts, authors, and experiences from around the world. Each episode is an unforgettable exploration into the depths of the extraordinary. That's right, Exo Nation. Join me every week as we open the door to the supernatural and explore the strange and amazing stories that will leave you questioning everything you thought you knew. And it's not just radio anymore. With our groundbreaking TV show, 
You can now witness the sessions unfold right before your eyes. From chilling reenactments to captivating visuals, prepare yourself for a multimedia experience like never before. With a legacy spanning over two decades, the X Zone Radio and TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, is your ultimate source for mind blowing entertainment and thought provoking discussions. Join our growing community of truth seekers as we continue to unlock the world's mysteries. So, why wait? Step into the X Zone and embark on a journey that will challenge your beliefs, ignite your curiosity, and keep you on the edge of your seat. Remember, Exxon Nation, the truth is out there, and it's waiting for you right here on the Exxon Radio and TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell. Don't miss a minute of the action. Tune in now on your favorite radio station or visit TV.com to join the adventure. The Exxon Radio TV show with Rob McConnell, where reality meets the unknown. The X-Zone Radio TV show, unraveling the secrets of the universe, one episode at a time. For more information visit www.xzoneradiotv.com. As I said before the break, we'll uh, be discussing more UFO sightings. One of the questions that often comes up, I mean, pe question, pe questions people ask me is, how do you get involved in a specific case? With Socorro, this is the Lonnie Zamora sighting from April 24th, 1964, blatted craft, the two beings outside. How do I get in, involved in that? And I was interviewing um, Ben Moss and uh, his friend, Tony, uh, Tony Angelo, Tony Angel, uh, Angelino, any Ben Moss. And uh, they had made a statement on the program when talking about it, said that there had been three calls into the police station prior to Lonnie Zamora finding the landed craft. And I said, and you check the police log. And I never got an answer. And I asked two or three times about that. Did you get, an ad, did you check the police logs? And they, I don't know why they dodged the question because the answer was very simple. So I went back into my files, which include Project Blue Book materials, and found a report that had been written on the night of the sighting by Captain Richard Holder. He was assigned to the White Sands Missile Range. His duty station was close to Socorro as opposed close to Alamogordo, which gives you an idea of the expanse of the White Sands Missile Range. So he was uh, called in, and I don't know whether he went in first and then Arthur Byrne, who was an FBI agent, went in or, FBI, or the FBI agent called him. But anyhow, both of them ended up in the police station and interviewed Lonnie Zamora within literally hours, minutes of him returning to the police station with the sighting. And they talked about what was going on, what he had seen. There is a half-page document, single space, which is probably a preliminary report that Holder wrote to the command post at the uh, Pentagon explaining what was going on. And in the text of that report, it said, he says three people who called the police station uh, about something in the sky, some big roar in the sky. Uh, the police didn't think it was anything they had to do anything with. So they didn't bother to write down the names. Oh, just maddening. And then Zamora, of course, made his, his report. And within minutes of Zamora making his report, a state policeman, uh, Sam Chavez showed up as well, he, he being a friend of, of uh, Zamora. He got there too late to see anything, but he saw the state that uh, Zamora was in when he arrived. Zamora said that he had come over a crest of a hill and down in the Arroyo, Arroyo he had seen what he thought was an overturned car, and he was trying to get his car down there for a closer look. Um, and as he approached, he realized it wasn't a car. It was some kind of a egg-shaped craft sitting on four landing gear. He stopped his car and he got out. He got within about uh, 50 yards of it. He, he got very close. He heard something in from coming from the back of it, and these two small creatures walked out uh, around it, uh, spotted him, and then ran back inside the craft, and there was a roar, and it took off. There was a symbol on the craft, which became or has become quite the controversy, uh, but he wrote, he uh, copied down what it 
look like on a scrap of paper. And that scrap of paper happens to be in the Project Blue Book file. So we know what, what he originally said. They changed the symbol for some of the news reports because I think it was Holder who suggested that um, they could use that to weed out the copycats. If they didn't know what the symbol looked like, then obviously they were making things up. Uh, Burns suggested he not mention the alien creatures because that would open him up to a lot of ridicule. Neither one were doing that to suppress the sighting or hide the information. They were just trying to conduct a, a proper investigation and they were worried about what would happen to Zamora if he started talking about alien creatures. He mentioned the creatures were uh, like 10, 12 year old children wearing white coveralls and that sort of thing. Later on, he talked about how it seemed like they were just floating garments out there. And I think that was a way of kind of uh, mitigating the idea of alien creatures. But anyhow, the craft took off in, in a roar. The landing gear left the traces on the ground. There was a burned area underneath the craft. I'm not sure about the uh, uh, usefulness of a chemical engine to take off into the atmosphere. I mean, we use them all the time to get into space, but we're not traveling interstellar distances. And I'm not sure how a chemical reaction engine is gonna allow you to travel interstellar distance. And anyway, um, that was what he said. The story had always been there was a, it was a single witness. Well, it's not, we know about three people who called the police. Um, Ray Stanford, I think, talked to a couple of women, a couple of days later, older women who had seen the, uh, seen the craft, seen the craft in the sky. Um, I asked him for the names and he just couldn't find them in his notes, which I thought was odd or whatever, but that's kind of the, the problem with it. There were other sightings in the area of a similar craft at the same time. There was a, a senior NCO um, south of Socorro who was working on his car and saw something in the sky. And there was a fellow up in uh, um, La Madera, New Mexico, which I think is up closer to Santa Fe that saw that sort of thing with the, the um, chemical reaction engine and that sort of thing. The Air Force wrote that one off as being a, um, uh, a fire of junk in a junkyard. He really didn't see a craft, he just saw the burning area, which of course makes no sense. Um, Jalen Hynek, the Air Force consultant to Project Blue Boom, was sent to Socorro to talk to people. He talked to some more and some of the other witnesses there. Uh, he wanted to go to La Madera to talk to the witness there. And the Air Force said, no, you were sent to Socorro, you come home. So he didn't get a chance to talk to the, the witness at that time, which is too bad. So we have other instant, instances of people seeing stuff at the same time, credible witnesses kind of corroborating what uh, Zamora said, but it was an interesting case. And you had the landing traces. Air Force, um, the, the, the Air Force officer in charge of Project Blue Book, uh, Hector Quintanella, said that uh, he went he went physically to investigate this case, which was odd because he normally didn't get out of the office to do that sort of thing. But he went down there to talk to Zamora and he went to Holloman Air Force Base, which does a lot of, or did a lot of uh, classified work and operated in conjunction with White Sands Missile Range, White Sands Proving Grounds, uh, with a letter saying that he was authorized everything through top secret. He had a letter um, that, that uh, provided that information. I know when I've traveled in the past, uh, the, the orders I've traveled on mentioned that I had, you know, like top secret clearance. I wasn't necessarily cleared for everything that was top secret, but it was that I had a top secret clearance. This one said that he was authorized everything and he couldn't find out an explanation for it. He said he thought it was locked somewhere in Zamora's mind, meaning that he'd seen something that he just didn't understand and it hadn't been communicated, but we had that bit of information. We would be able to figure out what he'd seen. So he was, he, he labeled as unidentified. One of the, I think, three cases in Project Blue Books where creatures were reported and the witnesses weren't called psychologically. But um, we've got all of that. The skeptical explanation, and I saw this on a program just the other day, two weeks ago, something like that. And the skeptical community was saying it was a test of the un uh, lunar lander, which had the kind of landing gear that Zamora suggested, but of course it wasn't a, a smooth egg-shaped craft with a bizarre symbol on it. And they said that it was carried by a helicopter. So they were they were testing, I guess, um, landing capabilities of the lander by by using a helicopter to move it around and, and, and set it down to see how it happened and so how they got off the range. Well, my question was immediately, 
uh, how could Lonnie Zamora not have seen the helicopter? And if it was a helicopter, he would have mentioned it. There would have been sound. There would have been noise. But we're left with this idea that uh, it, it might be a viable situation. We, it, we did find out that a lunar lander was being tr uh, tested at, at the missile range, but it had no internal engine. It, it was had to be carried around. The testing land uh, ended before Zamora saw the object, and it doesn't explain the two bizarre small pilots. There was, there may have been one uh, lander that did have an engine in it at the time, but it was on the West Coast. So what the documentation shows is this, this lunar lander thing doesn't really work. So we've got a very good um, case here. The explanation uh, of the lander is one, there was also the explanation that it was the college students who didn't like Zamora because he would write him tickets and he was stern with them and that sort of thing. So they wanted to create this hoax, but they never explained how it was done. Now, how did they get the thing in there? How did they get it out? Why weren't there a lot of tire tracks and footprints and all of that around there? There were some small footprints found, but not shoe shaped footprints, if you know what I mean. So it uh, is the one case that Quintanella, one of the cases that Quintanella uh, investigated himself, and one of the few cases in Blue Book where there were alien creatures seen that was labeled as unidentified, which kind of moves me to uh, how did I get involved in it to 1973 and the Hicks and Parker abduction. And this was uh, Pascagoula in October of 19, 1973. They were fishing on the Pascagoula River, which is like, you know, 14 feet from the uh, um, Gulf, that's really not that close. And uh, they uh, were abducted at that point, taken aboard a craft, examined, and then put back to where they were, were found, uh, which caused quite the controversy. But here were two guys who were abducted together. Uh, Parker said at the time that he was so frightened he passed out, he didn't remember anything. That, that of course, wasn't true. He didn't want to have to deal with the media and all the ancillary problems of telling such a story. Hickson kind of embraced the idea, but Parker didn't want to do it. So Hickson told him just to uh, pretend he'd passed out. They went to the sheriff's office. Uh, there is a story that they went to the media first, but I think what happened there was uh, they were on the way to the sheriff's office and they didn't know what time it was. And they stopped at a large building and they wanted to go in to, inside to look at a clock. I'd, Stumbling there because I think Hickson went in to look for the clock but didn't find it. So it was later than they thought. They went on to the sheriff and told their story, which of course was not believed. The sheriff and the deputies left him, left them in a room, and they did not know that there was a recording going on. So we have a recording of what they discussed alone in the room. And if it's a hoax, you would expect them to discuss the elements of the hoax, which they didn't do. Um, and that tape has just surfaced again. I think uh, David Mahler's got a copy of it now, which is an important important piece of evidence. Uh, the next day they were taken to um, Keesler Air Force Base in Mississippi to be checked out to see if there was any kind of radiation or radio radioactive uh, contamination to them. And while they were there, they were interrogated by uh, the base intelligence officers and uh, some other interested people. And what is important about that interrogation is not that they went to Keesler Air Force Base to be examined, but there was a document created that day. I think it's the, uh, the 12th of October, 1973. And in that document, it mentions who all was there, what officers were there, what they were doing. And it mentions that there were other people who saw the UFO. So not only do we have Hickson and Parker being abducted together, we have the tape. Now we have the names of four witnesses who saw the abduction while it was taking place. We're close enough to see it. And I think that's an important piece of evidence as well, because it's the next day before there was a lot of discussion about this thing that we had that sort of uh, that information. And, and they were interrogated by the Air Force. The question also becomes, why was the Air Force interrogating these guys about the sighting? because the Air Force didn't investigate UFOs anymore at the time. And they make a, made a big deal about that. If you would call the local Air Force base with a UFO setting and say, we don't do that if you feel threatened, call the police, you know, that sort of thing. So it becomes an important case because of that. And it becomes an important case because of the investigation that surrounded part of that. And it becomes an important case because we got to see how the um, 
skeptical community dealt with that information. So when I come back, I will explain that to you at length and then uh, talk about what is going on in the world today in the way of UFOs, or as they like to call them, UAP, uh, which we talked about a little bit last time. I'll be back right after this. Welcome to Haunted Indian River County by Larry Lawson. Indian River County is an idyllic vacation spot on Florida's east coast, not far south of Cape Canaveral. Known as part of the state's famed Treasure Coast, many are unaware of the deep and fascinating history this area played in the development of the Sunshine State. Also lost among its visitors and residents are the chilling stories of the hauntings that accompany this rich history. It is here that a man named Waldo still looks after his family and properties, six decades after his death. Or a retired preacher is seen digging up his hidden treasure, days after he died. Larry Lawson spent more than 40 years in the law enforcement and criminal justice education profession. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Nova Southeastern University and a Master's degree in Public Administration from Troy State University. He serves on the board of directors of the Indian River County Historical Society, is the director of the Florida Bureau of Paranormal Investigation and is the owner of Indian River Hauntings, LLC, where he provides historical and paranormal tours and events. He has been actively researching the history and paranormal legends of the Treasure Coast of Florida since 2010. Larry is currently the host of Paranormal Stakeout Radio TV show on the Exozone Broadcast Network and the past host of Encounters with the Other Side on WPSL Radio in Fort Pierce, Florida. Pre-order your copy of Haunted Indian River County by Larry Lawson on Amazon.com today. And I am surprisingly back. <laughs> Caught me off guard there for a moment. Um, when we went away, I was talking a little bit about the uh, importance of the uh, Pascagoula abduction case with Hickson and Parker. Uh, Philip Cass, of course, investigated. And if you read his book about his investigation into Pascagoula, most of it is about the credibility of the man who did the polygraph examinations, which I'm not sure is really relevant since if they pass the test with flying colors, uh, the skeptics would say yes, but there are people who can defeat it and it's not uh, uh, completely accurate and that's why it's not allowed in the uh, courtroom. And had they flunked it, they would be touting it. Well, this is very good. And the, the believers would say, no, we all know that uh, polygraphs aren't 100% true. Well, anyhow, Philip Class also made a, a statement that was interesting. He said that there was a major highway that went past the area where Hickson and Parker were fishing, and there was a heavily traveled bridge, and uh, people on that bridge should have been able to see the abduction taking place, and they couldn't. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I th think that it's important to go and view the sites, because you get a feeling for what can be seen and what can't be seen. If you traveled on the bridge, you would find out going one direction, the um, uh, way the bridge was constructed uh, blocked your view, and you would, if you looked out the back window, you could see the area for a second or two. And the other way, uh, it was also obscured by the vegetation and, and other things around the area. So you didn't get a good view from the bridge, basically because of the, the terrain and the uh, flora all around the area. So that, that kind of negates that. And he made uh, some other comments about uh, the truthfulness of Hickson and Parker. And I think it all really boiled down to personalities. Uh, Parker wasn't really thrilled with class and the way he uh, conducted himself. I've met, I met Philip class many times. I visited him in his palace. We went sailing on the Potomac Rover for crying out loud. So I knew him very well. Uh, the last time I saw him was at a MUFON convention, I think in 2000. And he asked me to help him up to his room because he was ailing. So I, I helped him get upstairs to his room. But, uh, but the point is he could be very charming if he wasn't talking about UFOs to people. And he just was on a, a kick about that uh, 
wanting to disprove it, uh, knowing that there just wasn't any alien visitation and therefore he went after him that way. If you take a look at all the um, testimony, and I, I did a book called 1973, which deals with the whole compendium of UFO sightings that were going on in that time frame. There's a whole bunch of sightings in Georgia that predated the, um, or preceded the uh, Nixon Parker sighting by, by four or five weeks, and then there were sightings afterward. But it was a, a, a series of sightings that lasted basically from the middle of September till about the middle of November. So it was a short period of very intense sightings with a lot of the UFOs been, been seen on the ground and a lot of uh, uh, talk of abductions and that sort of thing at the time. But if you're going to talk abductions, I think the Hicks and Parker is the most uh, credible of those, which doesn't necessarily mean it was extraterrestrial. It doesn't mean there's not a terrestrial explanation. Uh, but at the moment, we don't have a good terrestrial explanation for what they encountered. Parker, um, as I said, claimed originally that he had passed out, so he didn't have much to say. But later on in his life, he um, opened up about what he had seen and how this event had, had uh, transformed his life, in essence. Uh, he lost jobs. He was in the Marines for uh, something like two months and uh, was discharged honorably from the Marines after, after, the, after this. Uh, I think what happened is he probably had some sort of seizure and uh, was found unfit for military service because of that. When I was in basic training, we had a guy on our, in my barracks who uh, apparently was epileptic, and somehow he got past the uh, doctors. And I remember one night he had a seizure, and it took like four of us to help him out. And he was discharged like the next day too, probably honorably because he hadn't really concealed anything from the military. Um, it apparently didn't try to get out of being in the military. It just that his medical condition precluded him serving. And Hickson had the, I'm sorry, Parker had the same sort of thing. So Parker, Parker tried to serve in the military. But as I say, there's, there's some good documentation for this. There's a lot of other sightings in the area at the time. There's a lot of other information about that. And the, and the book is, uh, the book about that is uh, 1973, and that came out just last year. Now, as I promise, I'm going to talk a little bit about the current status of the UAP. And what has gotten to me is we've been looking at this stuff since 2017, when Leslie Keen and Ralph Blumenthal published their article in the New York Times about uh, the Tic Tac and the release of the videotapes, which may not be the most credible of evidence at the moment, but kind of got the ball rolling and got uh, the, the, the news media interested in this uh, rather than just ridiculing everything, kind of taking a good look at it. And it got the uh, uh, Congress to take a look at these sort of things. But what strikes me about this, if you go through the whole history of this, what we've got is the con Congress mandated you must do this sort of thing. The um, first reports are all about what they were doing to meet the mandate, how they were structuring the investigation, what they were gonna look for, definitions of what the various things meant. Uh, so they met the deadlines of reporting on what was going on, but they weren't really telling us anything. And if, you, if you've looked at the um, uh, other hearings that have been held, and, and a lot of them were, pub, uh, were open to the public, meaning simply they were streamed. And I sat through an awful lot of those, and it was always the same thing. Well, NASA is now involved in this, and here's what we're going to do, and here's how we're going to structure it but we don't have any information on sightings. In one of the cases, in one of the congressional hearings, there were two guys from the Pentagon whose names escaped me because I really don't care who they are, uh, being being um, interrogated by members of, of the House of Representatives. And they were asked at one point about the Maelstrom Air Force Base sightings, which was uh, um, a UFO sighting that involved the shutdown of an entire flight of uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. There were there were um, other sightings in the Belt, Montana area, Maelstrom being at Belt, Montana, and the missile fields are scattered with 100 miles around the area. And one of the uh, missile flights was taken offline. Ten missiles all went offline at once, which supposedly you can't can't happen, but it did. So that became a national security issue proving that at some point there are national security implications in the UFO sightings. Well, one of the um, congressmen asked them about Maelstrom Air Force Base. They said, we, we don't know what that's about. Later on in that very same interview, one of the guys said, well, yes, I know a little bit about Maelstrom. So, we, you know, he 
kind of backpedaled on that. But that gives you an idea. The, the congressman was more in tune to what had happened in the UFO field than these guys supposedly involved in the, the investigations of it. And that uh, kind of permeates the entire field of what's going on now. Every time they put out a report, it's the same thing that we've heard in the past. Kirkpatrick, um, Sean Kirkpatrick, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, who was the head of Arrow, which is, what is the all uh, aerial domain, all domain aerial resource office or something. I never cared to learn what the acronym meant. Arrow was just good enough for me. Uh, issued a month ago a 64 page report, basically saying the same thing the Condon Committee said. Well, we got no evidence. And when people are, uh, uh, the, 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 the UFO Committee is invested in these conspiracy theories because of the lack of transparency by the government on what's going on. And if we had full access to the information, it would not be conducive to the construction of conspiracy theories. And they, he wasn't looking for alien spacecraft. He was looking for um, sightings that had um, implications in aerial navigation, uh, get in the way of airliners approaching military aircraft, spying on our um, uh, uh, military activities, military exercises, that sort of thing. But he was saying that uh, it's all reducible to uh, people not getting access to all the information. And so they invent the information that they want to hear and that they uh, dismiss information that is counter to their points of view. I point out that, that uh, uh, Kirkpatrick did the same thing with his, his report, that there was information that he could have examined that he didn't bother to examine. So he was guilty of the same sort of thing. So that kind of is where we are. There's supposed to be more reports coming out, more people looking at this thing, more activities. But we'll learn more about the logistics of that, I'm sure, in the next reports and what they've done and what they haven't done and not necessarily a whole lot about what investigations are being conducted. If there is a spectacular sighting that they're kind of forced to address, I'm sure you'll see some information about it, but it won't be the whole story. And we can point to any number of UFO sightings like that from the past where uh, there was um, public interest in them and the investigation was less than enthusiastic, giving us a whole bunch of um, false leads or misleading or completely inaccurate uh, explanations for it. And I could go through the list of those now, but you've already heard some of it already, so I'm, I'm not going to bother you with that. I think that um, those of you who are interested in additional information, um, you can take a look at uh, my books that I've done on that. Roswell, I've done a bunch of those. It's, I'm always accused of creating a cottage industry in the Roswell books, but it's always information that I find interesting and I would publish it even if there was not any kind of financial uh, gain by doing so. It's just a story that I'd like, I'd like to tell. I think there's, there's something good there. I know of no uh, terrestrial explanation for Roswell at this point, which doesn't mean something won't appear in the, in, in the near future, but I suspect if there was a good terrestrial explanation when the Air Force investigated in the mid-1990s, they would have trotted that out rather than a ridiculous uh, mogul explanation. And I said, uh, 1973 takes a look at what was going on in the year of 1973 that includes the Hicks and Parker investigation or abduction, and some other abductions that turned out to be either fantasies or hoaxes or things like that. I was investigated a case in Lehigh, Utah, where a woman claimed that she and part of her family had been abducted in October of 1973. I am convinced now that she suffered from an episode of sleep paralysis, knowing more today than I did back when I investigated the case in the 1970s. I think that uh, I do get credit, however, for being the first person to report aliens in the house to abduct people. I don't think there's a report, published report, that precedes that. Now, afterwards, there are other people who came out talking about their ongoing longitudinal abductions, where they claim their first abduction took place in the 40s or the 50s. But none of that was reported prior to uh, my report in, in 1976 about, about that sighting. But it looks at all of that sort of thing, and I think it puts it in... Well, I'll say it a different perspective, and you can take a look at that. Um, understanding Roswell, which is the latest Roswell book, is also uh, a, uh, more of a, an examination of the people involved and how of all this came together. Uh, Roswell in the 21st century examines the mogul explanation at great length. 
I think there's over a thousand footnotes in the book. And some people have said the footnotes were more interesting than the text of the book, which may be true because I found some of the, the footnotes very interesting as well. But it gives you um, a good outline of what happened and when it happened and how all this came together. Understanding Roswell kind of uh, goes along with that, but takes it to a, to a different level. And for those of you who are living in Russia, I just had a, a book published in in uh, in the Soviet uh, Soviet Union in Russia. The Leveland book came out in Russia, and I have uh, two UFO books, three UFO books coming out in French in the near future as well. So I've got uh, some international exposure. As well, of course, an awful lot of information is, is on my blog at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. Type in a, a keyword and it'll bring up the articles that relate to that specific topic. And there's an awful lot of stuff about Socorro and Level Land and uh, the, the current crop of UFO investigators. And there was a long analysis of uh, speculation about what UFO crashes David Crush may have been talking about to the Congress. That's it for tonight or today. I will be back next week with Paul Hynek. So I'll see you then. Thank you for tuning in.